capable of homeschooling well in my own power. And then it's amazing what happens when we truly start to share with other homeschool moms that we are struggling, that we're frustrated. It creates an atmosphere of empathy, support, and encouragement. Because collectively, we truly want to see each other succeed. And even if we don't have the right answers for each other, it's really nice to hear another mom empathize and know that she's holding you up in prayer, just like we are holding her up in prayer. October then became for me that glorious time in my school year where I had to admit to myself and God that I simply am not strong enough or smart enough to do this in my own power. That's when I became earnestly real in my prayers. God, I know you have called me to homeschool and my desire is to do this well and to finish strong. And then there's that help accentuated by multiple exclamation marks. And isn't that what God is waiting for? That we continually surrender control of our lives to him. There aren't any scriptures that deal specifically with homeschooling. There are verses about teaching your children and raising them up in the Lord, but nothing that says homeschool moms go to this section of your Bible and here are all the verses you need to get you through the day. But I will leave you with this encouragement. And it's from God's word. And it's for you. And it's for me. Because I think we spend enough time as homeschool moms reviewing all of our shortcomings and checking off that list of things that we didn't do well or that we have on the back burner or that we're leaving unfinished. And if we are honest, well, there's a meme that I can't show you at the moment. But basically the meme is... Mary Poppins at the top of the screen and Cruella DeVille at the bottom of the screen. And it's in the heavenly places even as he chooses us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory formula for that because we can calculate launch and landing but without this conversion the capsule stays in orbit we can't bring it back home maybe we've been thinking about this all wrong how's that maybe it's not new math at all it could be old math something that looks at the problem numerically and not theoretically Math is always dependable. For you, it is. Euler's method. Euler's method? Yes. That's ancient. But it works. It works numerically.
That's it. Let's type it up. Huh. I truly enjoyed the movie Hidden Figures. And if you haven't seen the whole movie, the basic storyline details the efforts of African American women who worked as actual computers for NASA. It's entirely based on a true story, although I'm sure that Hollywood has added to it and glamorized the storyline. It does have that civil rights theme throughout, but the superstar in this movie is math. The main character who we just watched, Katherine Johnson, is simply put a math genius. And the scenes in which she is solving complicated math problems as a child in the classroom or as a grown woman at NASA are intriguing and inspiring. This is before the age of what we know as computers, so every complex math problem needed to be worked out on giant chalkboards, checked and double checked, because they were faced with the challenge of bringing astronauts back into the Earth's atmosphere after orbiting the moon, and there could be no room for error in their, in their calculations. So in the movie, Catherine has her aha moment when she realizes that the problem can be solved using the Euler method, which was discovered in the second half of the 18th century by Leonard Euler. And even Wikipedia credits him as discovering this method, which is an interesting word choice. I looked up the Euler method. I don't really understand it. It is supported by a lot of complicated math, but basically it's saying you have a start point and you have a theoretical end point, and you use tangents and a whole lot of other things that I don't understand. But they did it. And the inspiring thing is there's this human point of view, but the movie also makes math look exciting. So I loved math growing up, from elementary school all the way through my college classes. Math was this puzzle that needed to be solved. I loved working out one step after another on paper until I was certain that I had the solution. I loved that feeling of victory when I put the solution into the original problem and it worked. Math just like in the movie, was always a sure and a certain thing. There's one correct answer, and all I needed to do was follow the steps to find that answer. I was also fortunate enough to have math teachers who encouraged me throughout my education. Now I know that I was going to school in the age where girls were not encouraged to excel in math, but quite honestly, that wasn't my experience. My teachers taught me with expertise, they worked with me patiently, and they held the math bar high, just as high as they held it for the boys. I thought so anyway. As a seventh grader, I was in that first test group of the gifted students that took the SATs. Um, I don't think anything ever came of it, but it was really fun to test with 11th and 12th graders who were taking the SAT to get into college. And I did get some type of recognition at my high school graduation, but that was pretty much the end of it. My only failure in math was in 12th grade when we were studying the unit circle. Mr. Mangle tried, I had a lot of tutors trying to help me, and I never fully understood it. But the beauty of it is, is I've never had to use the unit circle as an adult, so I was safe there. Last month I shared that I felt completely unprepared to teach my children how to read. But when it came to math, I felt competent and I felt excited. I loved math throughout school. I was going to begin with kindergarten math and I was going to work my way through middle school. I admit that I had a high school math tutor in my back pocket and my goal was to just be that person at home reinforcing what she taught. So why does teaching math intimidate so many moms? Why do we look at math and we become overwhelmed? Or we immediately think, I'm never going to get my child all the way through high school math. 
Well, I have a few theories, and these are my own theories just developed over the years. One, I think we tend to jump ahead. Instead of remembering that we are starting with kindergarten math, and working to first grade and second grade, and that we are progressing with our children, I think we all jump all the way to high school math. Instead of enjoying the math that we fully understand, we put ourselves in that mindset where we're all worried about algebra and geometry and trigonometry and how am I going to get there? And meanwhile, we have a five-year-old in front of us. Two. I think we might think of our own math failures and believe that it will just automatically make us bad math teachers. We remember all the difficult and the complicated aspects of math and we allow our brains to dwell on those. And then three, I think if we're honest, some of us just don't like math. Maybe we didn't enjoy math during our own school years and reading and history excited us, but math didn't really do so much for us. And sometimes as homeschool moms, we tend to make that subject that we liked the least our back burner subject. So before I delve into some elementary math methods, I would like to challenge you to get past your own math anxiety. And it's always amazed me that math anxiety, I think, was the first school anxiety term we had. Oh, my child has math anxiety. I'm like, maybe, but maybe not. <laughs> Give yourself a fresh start with math. Remember that you are beginning your math experience all over again. Relax and enjoy math. Even if it's just for the elementary school years, enjoy math. This is the math that you can still do, that I can still do. Lastly, remember that you are teaching one year of math at a time. Don't worry about next year yet. Don't worry about high school yet. Just focus on this year's math. And I realize for most of us homeschool moms, we're doing several maths in a year. But just enjoy the math you're in. So just like reading, math is a subject that builds on itself. We need to lay a firm foundation with numbers, basic math functions, and facts before we can advance to complicated equations. Math is also a subject that requires mastery. In fact, with math, early mastery is the goal. As our children progress in math, they will need to constantly go back and pull from the foundational principles that they learned in elementary school and pull them into higher math grades. So we're starting here, but we're constantly pulling all through high school. So it's our job in elementary school to lay that firm foundation that will support a lifetime of math. So we're not feeling any pressure, right? This is really difficult for me in 20 years of homeschooling and working with other homeschool moms to not name specific curricula this morning. And I'm not going to do that. I have some very strong opinions about curricula what's good, what's okay, and what you just shouldn't even, you should just walk by that booth at the curriculum fair and just not even look at it. But I will not name any specific curricula this morning while we are filming. If you wanna talk about something afterwards, that's fine. But while we're live, I'm just going to give some suggestions and some math helps. Um, although sometimes Joel will bring up the math program that I like the least just to get a reaction out of me and he'll say Susie tell me what you think about and then I'm like that's not even math I don't know what that is but it's not math so you're probably not using it we don't have to worry about it the first thing you want to focus on though is to purchase a quality elementary math curriculum and I'm going to give you some tips on what that should include so first of all do your research just as you research a phonics or a reading program, don't simply take the advice of other moms. Go online, 
go to curriculum fairs, and really take a look at math books. Compare them. What are the things you like? What are the things you don't like? How clearly are the lessons presented? How easy is it for you to use as a mom? Does it have clear and easy to follow answer keys? So the first thing that you're looking for, does your elementary math curriculum have a multifaceted approach? Does it have an oral component or what my curriculum called mental math? Is there that point every day or every lesson where you're just solving some things out loud, where you're thinking about math problems, when you're talking about math problems? Is there some type of written work as well? Last month I talked about that hand-brain connection, and that's the way God created us, that as we write, as we work on our spelling words, what our hand does, our brain remembers, and it creates that muscle memory. So does your math curriculum, the one that you're looking at, does it have a writing component? Are your children actually working math problems out on paper? And if it's a computer-based program, and there are many quality computer-based programs, does it allow you that option? Could you turn the computer off and have your child work things out? Because muscle memory is so important. Does your program have speed drills or math fact pages for the four basic functions? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Those are your four foundational functions. Do you have speed drills or practice pages? We had speed drills. I never set the timer until my children were a little bit older. I wanted to take that pressure off beating that two-minute clock or that three-minute clock. Or I'd set the timer in another room for a little bit longer than the suggested time, and that child would still beat that timer. Does the curriculum cover a wide variety of math concepts and topics? So beyond the four functions, we should be introduced to fractions, decimals, graphs, geometry, word problems, patterns, measurements, and data collecting. Are those things being introduced at the elementary school level? And the last thing to consider is the one I think is the most important. Does this math curriculum constantly teach new concepts, regularly teach new methods, clearly and somewhat swiftly? Meaning we don't spend a month or two months or half a year on just one type of problem. But does it teach new concepts in a way that we're constantly reviewing the past types of problems? that there's a new element each day and there's thorough review constantly taking place. You do want a math program that teaches new problem types and functions and concepts at an appropriate pace for that grade level. But there needs to be constant review of the old concepts and problems so that your child doesn't forget them or doesn't get rusty. As much as I loved math, as far as I went in math in college, I haven't used most of that higher level math. And I, I have gotten rusty. And there are things I simply can't do in Algebra 1 or Algebra 2 anymore. But with a good elementary curriculum, your child won't get to something in fourth grade and say, I haven't seen that since second grade. There will be that constant review taking place. My last suggestion concerning curriculum choice is to try to stick with the same curriculum all the way through elementary school. Obviously, if you choose something that isn't right for you or your child and it's causing more confusion than learning, you'd need to change. But I like to tell moms, if you stick with one curriculum, you don't create any gaps by constantly bouncing from one to the next, to the next. And I think sometimes I've seen moms create their own gap simply because they've changed curriculum every single year. So try to choose one that you like and stick with it. Final word on curriculum. 
make it your goal to complete the entire book each year. I will admit we are overachieving 100 percenters in my house when it comes to certain subjects. But math and reading were the two subjects that we completed 100% of every year. Because the end of the math book is still teaching new lessons. And even the beginning of the next grade reviews them. It's a review. It's not teaching it quite as thoroughly. So make it your goal to finish that book each year. What I love about math is that it's a universal language. Math is the same worldwide. God created math. We can see how he orders the universe and all of creation using math formulas and principles. And as we work with our children, as we go through that math curriculum every year, it's the perfect opportunity to show them God in math. Shapes, patterns, numbers, formulas. God truly thought of these things first, which is why so often when you read about a math theory. It's often discovered. It's never invented. It's discovered. Archimedes discovered all of these things. The Pythagorean theorem was discovered. It's not new to us. We didn't invent it, but God did. And how exciting to take a subject like math where we might think, well, God's not in this subject, and totally show our children God is the inventor of math. He is so in this subject. So we start with numbers. And I know that for some of us, we're, we're well beyond numbers. Um, but I like to start at the beginning. Numbers are simply symbols that we assign value to. As you teach numbers, make sure that you have visuals or manipulatives. Young learners need to see what a number looks like. They need to understand how many. Otherwise, it's just a marking on a page. Before your child is ready to write numbers on his own, practice by tracing. And there are so many pre-K and kindergarten workbooks that you can buy even at the dollar store that have traceable number pages. You can also have your child practice numbers using Play-Doh, cold spaghetti, or fill a cookie sheet with sand or shaving cream. Write the number, so you're working on two, you wipe it away and you start all over again. It's fun, it's a good way to practice with less frustration than a pencil on a piece of paper. Young learners also like to practice writing on whiteboards or small chalkboards. And again, we haven't wasted a lot of paper because we wipe it off and we write it again. Keep in mind that the numbers 2 and 5 and 6 and 9 are so often confused by young children. Practice, but don't be too alarmed if your child has a hard time with these two numbers. Play games that involve numbers. We played shoots and ladders and rummy cube and we counted that as school time because we were looking at ordinal numbers, numbers in order. We were looking at number recognition, one through a hundred. We created our own math games. When my children were first learning number families, tens, twenties, thirties, forties, we made a big board and had number family houses on them. And they basically had a cut up hundreds chart and they just put the numbers in their right houses. Of course, all the numbers talked to each other, and they had a nice time once they got in their house. Find numbers wherever you go. Give your child a list of numbers to find as you run errands and have a numeric scavenger hunt. Even if they don't know that 5, 5 is 55, they can still look for those two fives together. Introduce the hundreds chart early. We only really need to teach our children the numbers 0 through 100. After that, we're just using combinations of 1s, 10s, and 100s as we identify larger numbers. If we know 100, then we know that 200 is 200 and 300. 
If we know that million has six place values after the comma, then we just need to see that it's 365 million. So truly focus on zero through 100. We used the hundreds charts for a, very, a variety of activities. One game was called Catch That Number. And we created a baseball mitt out of a piece of poster board. We cut a square in it that fit exactly over a square in our hundreds chart and we glued a popsicle stick to it. I would call out the number and my children would race to see who caught that number first on their own hundreds chart. Count everything. Encourage your child to count aloud just as you encouraged her to read. Praise your children as they learn to count to higher numbers without help. And I always found it amusing when you'd ask a child, how high can you count? And they'd give you an answer like 37. And you'd say, well, can you count any higher than that? No, I can count to 37. And it's sweet. And then maybe a week later, they say, I can count to 53. So who knows why their little brains stop when they stop, but just encourage that counting. Take advantage of math work pages where your ch child draws a line from the number to match a number of objects on the other side of the page. This isn't just busy work. It's a valuable tool to recognize the value that we assign to the numerical symbol. Help your child to think in terms of ordinal numbers, and those are just counting in order. As you stand in line, count the people in front of you. First, second, third, fourth, and we are fifth in line. And then do a quick recount every time somebody makes their way out of line. First, second, third, and now we are fourth in line. While we're learning and mastering numbers, there's still so much more that we can be teaching our children math-wise. Shapes both flat shapes, which are called planar shapes, and three-dimensional shapes. These are the building blocks for geometry. Manipulatives are nice, but you don't need to purchase manipulatives. You can find shapes in nature. You can find shapes in your home. You can find shapes at the store. Wherever you go, there are flat shapes. There are three-dimensional shapes that you can show your child and have him identify them. Patterns. We had pattern blocks. I loved pattern blocks. They're great manipulatives. You can create patterns with them. But help your child see patterns virtually everywhere you go. Petals on a flower create a radial pattern. Cans of vegetables on a store shelf create a nice, ordered, regular pattern. Legos spilled on the floor, or Cheerios from Gary's presentation, that creates an irregular pattern. So before you focus on picking them up, look at the pattern. We have several things, all of the same shape. How are they ordered? Sets. You can use anything to teach the concept of sets. And then sets aid us later when we get to addition and multiplication. But basically, you are teaching your child to gather like objects together by a common identifier. A large box of crayons becomes a lesson in sorting color. We have a set of red crayons over here. We have a set of orange crayons over here. Over here we have a set of purple crayons. Time. I do suggest purchasing a Judy clock to teach analog time. It was so helpful. You move those hands around, it's already marked for you. The smaller ones aren't that expensive. But at the beginning, while you're still learning numbers, you can teach your child to recognize time on the hour and then time on the half hour. And the other thing I like about that Judy clock is we can use it for fractions as well. We call it quarter past the hour because we've divided our circle into quarters. Fractions. Cut an apple in half. Two halves make a whole. How many slices are in the pizza that was just delivered? Count the sections in an egg carton. 
We don't need to worry about naming fractions yet, but young learners can understand that equal parts make a whole. Two halves make the whole apple. Eight slices make the whole pizza. Measuring. Our math curriculum had us measure with our hand or toe to heel before it ever introduced a ruler. We learned the concept of measuring using something other than a ruler, but still a standard unit. We would all walk across the floor, heel to toe. How many of mom's feet does it take from one end of the living room to the other? How many of Matt's feet? How many of Abigail's feet? So we all had a standard unit of measure on our body, and they got the idea that we can measure things. And then money, counting, saving, spending. As children begin to understand the value and use of money, homeschooling, I think, provides wonderful opportunities for budgeting and purchasing and recognizing money. So next we come to the four key functions. The key building blocks of higher level math are all rooted in addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. These four functions do need to be mastered and memorized before children will truly succeed in middle school and high school math. My daughter let me in on another little secret from the public schools at the beginning of the year. What they're doing in Common Core Math in elementary school where you write your answer and you explain your answer and maybe there's another possible answer for this specific math problem. They get to middle school and they don't do that anymore. They need to know standard math. In our house, we called it math fact regurgitation because I should be able to say a math problem and you should be able to spit that answer out without thinking. And years ago, as I tutored a ninth grader in math, he could plug all of the right numbers into the problems. He knew exactly how each type of problem worked. He understood that. But he'd never learned his math facts lickety-split. He couldn't just snap those answers out. So even though he'd had the entire problem set up correctly, we'd come to a halt when we'd get to a multiplication set that he didn't know and we'd have to wait. And I told his mom, even though he's a high schooler, you're doing this privately. He's not in a classroom. Get some flashcards. Work on those math facts. My math curriculum introduced addition in a way that I didn't understand until we actually started with it. We learned our doubles problems first, and I was thinking in my brain, why aren't we doing plus one, and then plus two, and then plus three? But we learned doubles first, and then we learned doubles plus one. And I thought, oh, I think I understand this a little more. We learned all the facts eventually, but it was in a different manner than I thought, and it worked for my children. We learned plus 10, and then we learned plus nine. And how easy it was to tell my children, well, plus nine is just plus 10 minus one and how quickly they understood it. And my daughter and I were trying to figure out a timeline not too long ago that spanned from the 20th century to the year 2019. And I found myself just doing that whole method in my head, saying, oh, okay, well, we're, in nine, we're starting at 1949 or 1941. We were starting at 1941 and taking it up till now. So I add 19 later. Really, I just add 50 and I subtract the 1. So I added 50 to the 19, subtracted 1. And she's laughing and she said, you're, you're doing our elementary school math program. I said, it works. So whatever tricks work. But it was so easy to understand once we started how the math facts built onto the previous set. Use flashcards, use math fact pages, use speed drill, as much additional practice as you can give your child. We used the hundreds chart for skip counting, and then this became our launching point for multiplication. For skip counting, we covered every multiple of two, or three, or four, or five, a different hundreds chart for each 
skip counting. And it created this pattern on our page, but then it gave us that launching point for multiplication. I could say, see, this is, these are your five facts. These are your four facts. Four times one is four. Two times four is eight. We're just skipping through. So it gave my visual learner additional help as we weaned ourselves off the manipulatives. Teach addition and subtraction and multiplication and division together. It makes sense when we teach and learn inverse operations together. Children understand opposites. Use fact families. We worked a lot with fact families. I would give my children three numbers. This was after we had our math facts pretty well established. I'd say write 7, 15, and 8 on your paper. Now my child's job was to figure out which two which two functions are we using? Well, obviously, 7, 15, and 8, these are two addition and two subtraction. The numbers are right there. My child is simply copying those numbers and creating two addition problems and two subtraction problems. And we might look at that and think, is your child really learning anything? Is any learning taking place? But what's happening is that hand brain, that muscle memory, that eventually, when you just give your child the seven plus eight, their hand fills in that 15 automatically. It works with multiplication and division as well. Sometimes as we got into fourth and fifth grade, I'd give them fact families that were of different types on the same page, eight, 56, and seven. Okay, so now they know, oh, that's not addition. So obviously that's eight times seven equals 56. And then inverse 56 divided by seven equals eight. But our children do learn from muscle memory, from writing those problems down. And then at some point, muscle memory just kicks in. So our goal, as I stated before, was math fact regurgitation. It's not a pretty term, but it's the term that worked for us. I wanted my children to know those four math functions so well that they didn't need to think about it. As we worked with flashcards and speed drills and oral quizzes in the car, even jumping up and down on the trampoline, they could spit those facts out quickly. As you work on your math fact mastery, it's important that your children work with pencil and paper, as I just stated. Mental math is terrific, but my child, who's the mental math whiz, really struggled in his first year of algebra because he wanted to do it all in his head. He hadn't had to write anything down on paper yet. His mean mother made him write everything down on paper. But in Algebra 1, he struggled until he realized, I have to write this down. Because when we'd check his work the night before math class, and I'd say, well, go back to your paper and find where you made your mistake. And he'd look at me and he'd say, you know I don't have it on paper. I said, well, then you'd better get some math on paper. But it's important. Elementary school is the right time to stress the importance of working math problems out on paper. Even if you use a computer-based program, which we used some in high school, we would shut off the computer and we'd do our math in a spiral. And then we'd turn the computer back on to see if we got it right. Okay, so what are some extra helps? If I'm not going to tell you math curricula that I love, what are some extra helps that you can use? We used the Kumon books. I did not use a math curriculum in kindergarten. Um, we, I just found it wasn't necessary. We could piece so many things together. The Kumon books have counting books. They have maze books. They have books about numbers and math facts. And which nice, what's nice about the Kumon books is it gets progressively harder. So as you're working in a book, the next step, the next page is a little bit more difficult. It has constant review. We used a lot of the Frank Schaefer homework helper books. Those are the books that you had at the top of the page, you know, the little bear that's fishing and you have all the little fish down in the ocean and each fish has a different addition 
sentence on him. And you color all the fish that equal five orange, and you color all the fish that equal six blue. Kids like that, but it's causing them to think about those addition problems. I found a book at a curriculum fair one year that was all math games that you could make out of manila file folders. There are dozens of these on Amazon. I looked them up for this presentation thinking I'd give you just one. You can do a search. There, there are dozens of them. But you just take a basic manila file folder and you cut and paste, some game elements go inside. What we loved about these, they were perfect for long car rides, they were perfect for waiting at places, they were perfect if we were visiting sick and shut-ins that my children weren't going to have things to do. They would fight over the math games, and I loved that. I thought, oh, they're fighting over math games. This is a good goal. There are two online sites, mathdrills.com, and I think these are on your page, and education.com work pages. Both of these have pages, math fact pages, speed drills, fact families, every math concept imaginable, they have a work page. So you don't have to invent all of these things on your own. You can download them, you can print. Both of them are free. MathDrills.com also has math games that your child can play online. I learned my multiplication facts using Schoolhouse Rock. My children learned their multiplication facts, well, helped learn their multiplication facts using Schoolhouse Rocks. Anything you can put to music. If we can sing it, we can learn it. My children learned the classification, the biology classification system to twinkle, twinkle, little star. Not my doing, somebody else's doing. But if you can sing it, you can learn it. So look up YouTube videos. Put that other element into your math that's fun. Um, there are YouTube songs and lessons, and there are so many helps online that I didn't have, but you have access to. My youngest had a leapfrog. I don't even know if they make those anymore, but my youngest had a leapfrog, and he thought it was just like his older brother's Game Boy, except all of his games were educational. So we just, you know, we had Batman math. We had all these math games, all these reading games, and he was playing Game Boy just like his big brother, except it wasn't, and it was learning, and it was awesome. Make math practical. Cooking and baking, we measure. You have the fractions written right on those cups and spoons. Building and home improvement projects, you need to measure. You need to get things done precisely. Home ec projects, anywhere where you can make math practical, do that. When my children were young and we just started talking about money, we would go to the store with their money at very slow periods of the day, we'd wait till the end of the line, we'd let people in a hurry go before us, and they'd make their purchases. Sometimes we would count out exact change beforehand. Sometimes they'd give a bill, and they'd have to count the change back. And I'd stand there and make them count the change. Anytime we can make math practical. So what are some helps for you? First of all, I encourage you to remember that your lo young learner's brain can truly only master one new skill at a time. I am almost certain that my oldest was born speaking in complete sentences. He was like this little old man. But every other child at church, at playgroup, on the face of the earth walked before this child. And I didn't know if he was ever going to learn to walk, but he could tell me to come and get him. So I guess that was good enough for him for a while. But our pediatrician was so intuitive, and he usually calmed all of my anxieties before I ever had a chance to give them voice. So he explained to me at the 14th month checkup, when my child is talking but not walking, he said, children's brains focus on walking or talking. Usually early walkers don't talk 
quite yet. Usually early talkers take a little bit longer to walk. Once one of them is mastered to a certain degree, then the brain switches over to master the other. And he did walk, and he's 25, and he walks, and he does all of those things, and we don't worry about it. My mother kept saying, he will walk down the aisle at graduation. And sometimes I would say, I'm not so sure. We're not getting anywhere. He'll just sit in his seat and talk about it. But he learned to walk, and he walked very well. And walking happened very, very quickly once he learned. But the same is true with reading and math. Last time I shared that I was also my oldest, who was the slowest to get through our reading program. And it's not because he didn't love books, but it was because he was an auditory learner. So reading, of course, is right there. You have to read it. You have to look at it. And while reading was slow, his math took off at this crazy pace for even me to keep up. He was so proficient in math, and he did so much in his head. And the lesson that we got to division, and I'm trying to think, how do I word this just right so that he understands it? He looked at it. He said, I got it. I said, you got it? He said, yes. And he basically gave me all the answers to the practice set one after another. And I said, how did you do that? He said, it's backwards multiplication, Mom. It's so easy. He goes, I got it. So his math was progressing quickly, but his reading took a little bit of time to catch up. By fourth grade, he was right on track with everything. You might have a child that's reading very well, very proficiently, but you might be thinking, what if we have a math deficiency here? Relax. Don't assume that it's a math deficiency quite yet. Once your child has mastered reading, his or her brain is going to switch to math mastery. Keep in mind, and this is one of the things that helped me as a former teacher being a homeschool mom, there's a cognitive leap that takes place somewhere between the beginning of third grade and the beginning of fourth grade. It just it happens. It's one of those cognitive leaps that children's brains make. And at the beginning of fourth grade, most of our children are all on the same page with math, with reading. They're right where they need to be. So just keep teaching your child diligently. If your child's a little bit slower at math but quicker at reading, it will level out probably. Don't get alarmed quite yet. And then after this leap takes place, most children are grounded in concrete aspects of math. And now you can take away those manipulatives and you're ready to start working with abstract math. It's just math without manipulatives. A couple more helps for you before I conclude. Look at the math lessons the night before. Our children know when we're not prepared. As much as I loved math growing up, I really wasn't good at doing math on the fly, just picking up the book in the morning and saying, we're going to sit down and do math. I looked at the book the night before. I went over the lesson. I read the lesson thoroughly. Usually it doesn't take that long in elementary school. And I would also solve the practice problems for myself so I could see any pitfalls that that particular child might have. If you use a whiteboard, write the practice problems on the board the night before in preparation for tomorrow. If you use paper and sit side by side at the table with your child, prepare the lesson and the problems, leaving room on the paper to do the work the next day. As you work with your child, be prepared to stop and review and make sure that your child understands. If your child truly isn't understanding something, it's not wise to keep pushing forward, to keep bulldozing through that math program. Stop. Make sure your child understands. Do some extra review. Get some math work pages offline. Get the manipulatives back out. But try not to stay stuck too long. Sometimes, by continuing through the curriculum, a concept that we struggled with back here, all of the sudden snaps into focus here 
because we've, we've practiced and we've reviewed and we've practiced and we've reviewed and now all of the sudden, maybe we just needed to understand how to use it back here. And we didn't understand how to use it, but over here, 10 lessons later, we understand how to use it. Now it makes sense. Now it snaps into place. Recognize that all of your children will learn math differently from each other. All of them. My oldest child, as I said, could do all math in his head. He taught himself how to do so much of his elementary school math. Sometimes I'd forget and he'd remind me. He's my auditory learner. He also spent a lot of time talking his math problems out loud. When he did get to high school, we would hear him at night doing his math. My husband would say, who is he talking to? I'm like, he's just doing his math. He talks it out loud all the time. My middle child is my very visual learner. She needed to see her math. Math was not her favorite subject, but she did extremely well all the way through her college math courses. She worked out every single problem, step by step, checked her work along the way, checked her answer, plugged it back into that problem up here to make sure it worked. My boys would tell her she uses far too much paper, but when she made a mistake in algebra later on, and I said, Abigail, go back to where you made your mistake, she could find it and she could correct it. My youngest, as I share all the time, he is my mystery. What worked in math one year definitely didn't work the next year. But what that taught us all was perseverance. We used the same curriculum, we just tweaked it from year to year and from child to child. He was intuitive. One year, those counting puppy manipulatives worked, and we used them for everything. And then the next year, he brought them to me in that Ziploc bag, and he said, I think I need to not use the puppies anymore. And I said, why? He said, well, I'm really just sitting out there having little puppy battles and little puppy picnics, and we're not really counting with puppies anymore. But he figured out what worked the next year. Two years of high school math, he used graph paper, and it worked like a charm. One digit per box, it kept everything in order. Well, by 11th grade, the graph paper wasn't working anymore. He just couldn't fit things into those little boxes, and it was frustrating. So lastly, don't become discouraged. It's elementary math. You can do this. You can teach your child to do this well. And every year that you master teaching math to your child, it prepares you for the next year, the next grade level. And who knows, you might even work your way through all of those math classes again that you can teach high school math when the time comes. Ruth, I am done. <laughs> you can turn it off.